this evening to Jonah chapter 2. Jonah chapter number 2. We'll take our time. Won't be too long, but we'll take our time. If I get going fast, I start to stutter and stumble and I forget what I'm going to say, so I'll just ease through it. What do you think about it? If I take too long, just throw a shoe at me and I'll get off. So. Jonah chapter number 2, uh, we'll begin in verse number 17. Let's read it one more time. It says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. O Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered thee, Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, and to thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Let's bow our heads and open up in a word of prayer before we get started. So, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to ask God once more that you'd put your hand about me, Lord. Guide me and direct me. Use me as you see fit, Lord. Um, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I don't take it lightly, and I hope you know that, Lord. And I pray that you'd be with us this evening, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so tonight... I would like to talk to you about a man who is well known for being swallowed by a whale. And, uh, you know, we've heard the story as a kid. But tonight, I want, I want you to think about something. I, I want you to think about this. Don't go down like Jonah. That's the title of my message tonight. Don't go down like Jonah, okay? Uh, many people use this illustration that disobeying God is bad. And Jonah disobeyed God, so he was swallowed by a whale. Therefore, we should obey God because God may have a whale for you and I. So for a child, this simple application may ring true, and it should ring true. Hopefully, though, we can grab something a little bit deeper uh, tonight. And, and maybe it's not deep at all. Maybe it's right on the surface. I don't know. I don't really care. I'm just doing what I was supposed to do. So no, <laughs> I hope the Lord can, can help you tonight if this is for you. Um, it it it. It's something definitely that I, it makes my mind turn and think sometimes. But, you know, uh, tonight I would like to use Jonah, though, as a picture of a New Testament believer. I would like to look at him in the sense of somebody who is, who is backslidden and far from God. And he, do, he does not have to be there. You realize most back, black, backslidden people, see, I try and get in a hurry, I can't talk. Backslidden people in church today. They're where they're at, not because of God's hand, but because of their own doing. They don't have to be there. They don't have to be where they're at, but they're there because they chose to be there. It's where they want to be, and we'll see that. But he's a New New Testament believer, Now I'd like to approach him in a sense, as I said, as a backslid man running from the call of God, and I would like us to see a few things that take place. We will see a prayer, a moment of understanding, and also a moment of repentance. And hopefully we can have an understanding of it all when we're finished. So let us look now and uh, we'll see a prayer take place in Jonah chapter 2. Uh, but I'd really like to put some emphasis on this real quick. Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And notice how it opens up in chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed. Then. Then. Okay, so a great question comes to mind. What took place for the word then to be used here? Why doesn't it say Jonah prayed? It says then Jonah prayed. So let's look over in Jonah chapter 1, and we'll start in verse number 2, 
and we'll look through verse number 4, and we'll get our answer. The Bible says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. He, he, he ran from the presence of the Lord. Make a mental note of that. And went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 5, too, because we'll come back to it in a minute. The, then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it for, for to lighten it of no, I'm sorry, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down and to the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. We're going to come back to that, verse number 5, here in a minute. But I want you to see, Jonah had three opportunities to get this right with God. All right? So, when he headed down to Joppa, he could have prayed then. When he decided to run from the presence of the Lord, he could have stopped before he ever got on the boat. And he could have repented, and, and, and he could have asked God to forgive him, and he could have went on to Nineveh and done what God had asked him to do. Number two is when he boarded the ship. When he boarded the ship, he could have stopped right there and, and asked God for forgiveness and could have went on about his business back to Nineveh and given the message that God had called him to give. And number three, he could have prayed when the storm hit. When the storm began to hit, he could have prayed right there. But where was Jonah? Where was he? What was he doing? He was sleeping. Verse 5. He was down in the sides of the ship, and he lay fast asleep. You know what? Before I move on, I talked to you guys a couple months ago now. I don't remember how long ago it's been. Um, about uh, bitterness. And I used Absalom. And he was comfortable in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 39... Uh, he was com comfortable in his sin. Uh, you know, I use verse 39 as, as a picture to show somebody who was, you know, com comforted. Absalom was comforted by his sin. And more than that, he was comfortable in his sin. I brought that point out about his bitterness. And you're in a sad state when you can find comfort in your sin. You're in a bad place when you're comfortable in what you're doing and the sin that's taking place. So I use that reference. And that is that was young Absalom in the story. And that's Jonah. That here again we see somebody. You know what? He he didn't have he didn't think very much of, of the people in Nineveh. He didn't think they were saving. So what did he do? He ran the other way. But he wasn't running from them. He was running from God. He knew he, who he was running from. He knew he was running from a call that was given to him to go and preach to these people. And where do we find him? Man, he was comfortable in his sin. That's a backslidden Christian. Somebody who's sitting in a pew in the back, you know, in the back pew back there. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Somebody's in the back pew. No, no, it's it's the person, you know, that, that you see on the street corner and they're not coming to church no more. And they're, you know, brother, the way you're living, you know, well, I know, but I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do anyways. I mean, I'm gonna die and go to heaven someday anyway, so I might as well do what I'm no, it's the wrong attitude. It's you know, it's the guy and the the woman or the man that's sitting there that's that's just they know truth and they're just denying. They don't care. They don't want to care. They, they're comfortable where they're at. They're comfortable living in sin. And that was Jonah. And that's the backslidden Christian. That's us sometimes. We've been there. I, I have been there before. I was comfortable in my sin. I was comfortable doing what I was doing and I didn't care. I don't care how many people told me it was wrong. I was comfortable. I've been there myself. And I had to, I had to come away from that. But... You know, it makes me think about Jonah sleeping through this storm. Look at verse number four. It says, uh, the, the, yeah, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. I've heard of some heavy sleeping. <laughs> I mean, he slept through a thunderstorm. This dude slept on a boat in the middle of a thunderstorm. Like, it, it, was, it almost tore the, the ship to pieces, and this cat was out. He was gone. Lights out, man. K.O. He was gone. I've heard of some heavy sleepers, but that's just ridiculous. You know, the very boat he is on is being beaten so hard that it's going to be split, you know, splinters. 
you know, and the, you know, the storm was likely to kill him, you know, but he, did, he doesn't even care. He almost died and didn't even care. His wickedness and his sin brought him to a place where he almost died. And he, man, what's he doing? He's sleeping. He doesn't care. I know a brother. I, I know a brother where I went to church. I, he, was, um, he had been saved for a long time, and he was, uh, he was a race car driver. And he, he, he was part of, well, he wasn't a driver, but he was part of a pit crew. And he tells a story about what brought him back to God when a big tire came across and sli- flew off and sliced him across the belly, put him in the hospital, almost killed him. So what brought him back to church and just got him thinking, you know, my life was almost, you know what? I hate it that people wait till a life or death situation happens and they think that's when they got to come. You know what? That brother's not in church today. He went, he went back out. He, he went away from the house of the Lord. That's sad to think about. And, you know, he was faithful. When I, when I first started going to church, he was faithful. He was going. Man, he's, he, he helped Kyle fly one time. He helped Kyle get back home and, and fly home one time. And, and there was a, a different situation there. But, man, he was, just, he was involved in church, and he was going. And, you know, one thing led to another, and wife left him. He was out of church, and, man, he was just done. And he knows truth. You know, and I love this brother. I talked to him many times about engines and boats and planes and all kinds of stuff. And it was really sad to see him go. But, man, you know, it's just people, they just don't care. They just don't care anymore. And that's the dangerous place to be. You know why? Do you know why that's a dangerous place to be? No, let me tell you why. Because Jonah's decision and behavior is no longer affecting only him, but the others aboard the ship with him. And these are unsa- These are men that don't know. In a, in, a, in a sense, thinking about it, looking at the scripture, if we're using Jonah as a New Testament believer, then these, then these sailors rep- represent unsaved people in this world. His decision is affecting these other men. His life. They had to draw lots to figure out, you know, whose fault it was. And the lot, the, the lot fell upon Jonah. And that's the state they were in. They had to figure this thing out, man. Jonah's life, his decisions were affecting other people around him. Don't think for an instant that if you are the that you are the only person being affected by your sin and disobedience. You're not. You got wife, you, your mother, your your father, you got you got hey, you got a teenager at home, you know, whatever's going on. Don't don't think people aren't watching you. Don't think. That's why, that's why unsaved people today don't want to go to church with a bunch of hypocrites. So why they, I mean, it's an excuse nonetheless, but still, I mean, it didn't come from nowhere. Some, sometimes it did. You know, they heard it from somebody. They heard that excuse from somebody. But hey, you know, I wouldn't want to go to church with a bunch of hypocrites either, but I come to the realization a long time ago, I'm just a big hypocrite as anybody. You know, best I can do is get up, ask God for forgiveness, and try and do right the next day, you know. Not saying my sin's okay. It's not. Nothing I did was okay that was in sin, you know. But doesn't mean I can't get right with God and move on. But hey, what you do affects other people. You think you getting in the car and bad mouthing a preacher doesn't affect your kids in the back seat? You are dead wrong. You think you going home and whatever your kick may be, you're sitting there, you know, do as I say, not as I do. You are dead wrong. That's being a backslidden parent. Now that's just ridiculous. You know, I, I'm not going to call you out on your stuff, and I'm not going to come in your home, but I'm telling you right now, if you, you know, if you hold truth, and you hold knowledge, and you choose to run away, and you live the lifestyle you want to live, and you're running from God, and you're far from God, be sure your sin will find you out, first off, but also know, hey, you're not just affecting yourself. You're affecting the others around you. Don't think for an instant you're not hurting anybody else. Chapter 1, verse 11 says, then, they, then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Verse 12, And he said unto them, This, is what, this was Jonah's answer. It wasn't, I want you to realize this was Jonah's answer. Before we move on, I want you to think about this. Jonah, Jonah could have said, Turn back and help me get to Nineveh. I have been running from the Lord. The right, you know... Then, right then, he could, have, he could have prayed and gotten right. No. What does Jonah do? He, he fixes it himself. Just like we do. We try and fix our sin ourselves. Just like David did. You think about King David. King David 
laid with another man's wife. And instead of coming clean and fixing it, apologizing to the man and getting before God and making it right, what does he do? He, instead, he kills the man. <coughs> that fixed everything. I killed him, you know. Hey, no, the problem is still there. Hey, no, he still got an, another man's wife pregnant. He still killed and murdered a man. But it didn't just affect him. It affected his household. And it affected a whole nation. Your, fin, your, your sin doesn't just affect you. And when you try and fix it yourself, it just makes it worse. For you. He says, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. Basically, <laughs> basically he, he, he tells him, Hey, kill me. Throw me off. <laughs> in a sense, I mean, he's in the middle of a, of a storm. He could have got right. He could have asked God to forgive him. No. He, he, goes, he goes and he says, hey, throw me overboard. That'll stop it all. I know what, you know, and then his self-righteousness. I'll save everybody. I know what will toss me overboard. That'll fix it. Yeah, it fixed it. Not for long. Not for him. You know, and that's a backslidden Christian running from God, affecting other people's lives with their sin and trying to fix it themselves instead of turning to God. He basically helps, has help committing suicide and God wasn't surprised. You know what? God's not surprised by your ignorance and sin that you run into and that you stay in, that you run from God in. God's not surprised by it. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Hey, I want you to realize something. People say that that whale was punishment. I, I tend to think sometimes that that whale was salvation. I, I tend to think sometimes that maybe, maybe... That's what saved Jonah's life in the long run. God had prepared a fish for him. Okay? That's what I think. I think the Lord prepared a fish for him to help him, to help bring him to some understanding. Because, you know, he has finally, three days and three, three nights later, Jonah finally prays. You know, finally. I want you to note something, though. I want you to know, I want you to know who he prays to, though. I want you to notice this. This is awesome. Because he's running from God. He's running from God. He knows it. He ran from the presence. What did it say? But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. So what he was fleeing from. This is what he prays in verse number 1 of chapter 2. Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God. Verse number 6 of chapter 2. O oh Lord, my God. Note that. In spite of Jonah's fleeing and running from God, these two phrases show Jonah's faith. Jonah knew that God had not abandoned him and that he was faithful and true to him. God was faithful and true to Jonah. Regardless of Jonah's state, after all of Jonah's backsliding, the Lord was still his God. And if you're trusting in the Lord... Tonight, if, you're, if you have received him as your Savior, but you're running, hey, maybe you are far from him tonight, but he is still your God, nonetheless. I want you to show, I want to show you what kind of God we have. I want you to, I want you to see somebody. And just to, just to recognize what kind of God we have, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 31, real quick. Nehemiah chapter number 9. Verse number 31, and it says, oh, one more page. Nevertheless, for thy great mercies' sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. So what kind of God Jonah has? A gracious and merciful God. How about, how about Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 5? Hebrews 13, verse number 5 says... Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I just want us to really grasp what kind of God we have. He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's a true statement. God will never leave you nor will he forsake you. He is faithful to you. And you should be faithful to him. 
That's the end of it. That's, that should be the end of it. He's faithful to you. Be faithful to him. You're, he saved you by his grace. It's your reasonable service to do a work for him. It's not unreasonable to give your life when he gave his life for you. You understand? It's not asking too much for you to give up your sin and your wickedness to give his gospel. To give the message of salvation to lost people. What do you have in your hands? What Brother Damon pre preached on this morning. Hey, what do you hold in your hands? What do you got? What do you carry? I've got marks. I've got scars. You know what? The Lord's given me. He's given me a message to give to others. He's given me a message to carry into this Nineveh, this world over here. He's given us something. But I want you to know, in spite of Jonah's fleeing, in spite, in spite of Jonah's running, the Lord was still his God. God was faithful to Jonah. God was faithful to Jonah. Just, I want you to understand, just and understand this. Understand something. Don't wait till the last minute when you're in the belly of your whale to call on God. And don't cry out just to get out. Cry out to get right. Have some understanding of why the Lord will chasten you. Understand that the things that come along when you're running from God are chase, they they are chastening from they, the Lord's chastening you, man. He's he's trying to give you some understanding on something. Hey, you're not right. This is happening because you're not right, and I'm letting it happen. Why? We'll answer that. Jonah came to this realization. We see Jonah came to a place of understanding, and and. He came to this realization, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit it real quick. Jonah may have waited till the last minute to pray to God, but he, cared, he, he cried by reason of his affliction. You say the only reason he cried out was because he was being afflicted? No, he understood the reason for his affliction. Therefore, he cried out to God. He was being, he was being chastened. The Lord was correcting him. But why? Jonah understood the reason of his affliction, and it finally clicked. Jonah recognized that the things happening to him were by the hand of God. God would never. Yes, he would. He will. He'll allow stuff to happen, so you'll draw near to him. He'll do it. Look at verse 3. He says, For thou hadst thy billows, thy winds. He knew who sent that. He knew who allowed it to happen. Jonah didn't have to be thrown over the board, be thrown overboard. Lord allowed it. Lord could have intervened and be like, no, hey, no, it's not good. Nope, nope, just turn around. No, no. That wasn't the answer. God allowed it to happen. He allowed the billows. He allowed the waves to tear the ship apart. When something takes place in your life that draws you back to Christ, it's not by chance, karma, or even a freak accident. And to, su to suggest it was would rob God of the blessing. To, su to suggest that everything that happened to me was just coincidence because ugh, I was being bad. No. No. If you're a Christian, you're saved. No. What was happening was God was chasing you. And to, to say otherwise would rob God of his glory. See, God wants you. He desires a relationship with you. Why would he just let you go away? No, he's going to let the things that he was protecting you from come up in your life. So you'll draw back to him like, holy smokes, things were never this bad when I was with God. <laughs> no brainer, I'll go back, you know. Hey, God allowed this to happen to help bring a man running from him back to him. Jonah understood this. Jonah came to that understanding. God was chasing him because God wanted him back. God was trying to draw him back to him. Notice again, he didn't say, they cast me into the... No, he said, thou cast me, talking to the Lord. Sometimes a storm is good for you. It lets you know where you stand with the Lord. It lets you know where you're at in your walk with God. Sometimes storms are good. And Jonah understood that. Jonah understood that, that his afflictions were the chastening of God. Hebrews 12, 6 says, for whom... I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to turn there real quick. We might read this. I think i got just a few more minutes. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I'm going to read down through verse 10. If we endure chastening, 
God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if, we, if ye be without ch- chastisement there, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasures, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know what happens at the end of this chapter of Jonah? A whole nation, a whole city comes back to to repent and is saved. And even then, Jonah still robbed himself of a blessing. But, but you understand, Jonah, was, Jonah got to be part of that. God wants the same for you and I. You can't fulfill the Lord's will of your life to give the gospel and preach and teach the gospel to others if you're running from Him. And you're missing out on something greater if you are. And Jonah was missing out big time. He was running from God. God doesn't chasten you for no reason. He chastens you so he can, because He loves you. He wants you to be partakers of His holiness. He wants you to dwell with Him. Reality is, nobody likes being corrected. Nobody likes storms. Nobody wants to be swallowed by a whale. But these things make God's love for us evident. I want to read some verses real quick out of Psalm. Psalm 119.67 Psalm 119.67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Verse 71 says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Verse 75 says, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that, th- and, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Thou, this is David, there's that word, thou has afflicted me, thou in faithfulness. God's faithful. Reality is, is no matter how stubborn, how, how, how much we run from God, how unthankful we are, God's faithful. Jonah understood from his affliction, his running and his sin had caused him to be cast from the sight of God, which brought him to a place of repentance. You know what? Prayer needs to take place. It's important. You don't need to wait till the last minute, till you're dying, till you're about dead to do it. But you first must come to a place of understanding you have to understand the reason for your afflictions. You have to understand that's because you are in sin. And God can't look on your sin. But He will never leave you nor forsake you. But God can't watch you be in sin. He can't. He's too holy for that. Same reason He can't let you into heaven unless you're saved. His grace has to be on you. His righteousness has to be about you. You can't enter in by your own righteousness. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. You need the Lord. But what happened before you got saved? You had to come to a place of understanding that you were in sin. You had to understand that your sin was wrong, and you had to repent as part of being saved. As a Christian, sometimes we fall back on our sin. We have to come to a place where we understand God's chastening is for correction, and it's to draw us back to Him, but we still have to repent of those sins and get it right with God in order to serve Him. We have to come to a place of repentance, number three. And I'll be done shortly. Verse number four says... Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Hey, saved person running from God, you need to stop running and turn from your sin and turn back to God. That's as simple as it is. Stop running in your sin, stop running from God, stop and turn to God. Sin in itself is a downward spiral. Real quick, Jonah went, in chapter, in verse 3, chapter 1, Jonah went down to Joppa. Verse 5, chapter 1, he went down in the sides of the ship. He went down where the waters compassed him about in chapter 2, verse 5, even unto his soul. Look at the word usage there. The water compassed him about even unto his soul. Down where the weeds were wrapped around his head, verse number 5, chapter 2. Down below the mountains, verse number 6, chapter 2. Down where the earth with her bars were about him forever. That's pretty down, that's down pretty far. Where the, where, the, where, the, where the earth with her bars were about him 
forever. Sounds, to, sounds a lot like me, like, like Jonah wasn't lying when he said, I cried out from the belly of hell. I want you to understand, Jonah was on the brink of death. Verse number 7, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Cutting it kind of close. You know what the ultimate end of sin is? Death. It's the ultimate, it's the ultimate end of sin. Death. Okay? Jonah was on the brink of death. That's where your running is taking you. That's, that's where all sin leads is death. Don't wait till that point to call on the Lord. I mean, obviously, it was a close call. It's all right to call on the Lord at your, when you need Him, but man, why wait till that point to get it right? Don't wait till that point to call on the Lord. Get it right now and turn to God now. Get right with God. Look again at verse 6, and I'm almost done. Verse 6, you're probably saying, thank God. Verse number 6 says, uh, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption. Look, even at the point of death, God brought up his life from his corruption. Because God is faithful. Don't play in your sin. Don't, don't, don't play around in your sin. Get it right with God. Don't wait till the last minute. Get it right with God. Look with me at verse 8 real quick, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be close. Verse number 8 says, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. It's a good statement. Jonah walked with God. He abode in, in the very presence of God. He heard God's voice directing his life. Literally, God talked to this man. Make that clear. Yet, yet he forsook his grand relationship. <laughs> he forsook it all. He sought vainly to live without God's guidance. That's the backslidden Christian. That's the person running from God. You have God's voice right here. You have a living word. God can speak to you through it. We have truth. Our salvation is of the Lord. If you're not saved tonight, if you look briefly, he says, he says salvation is of the Lord in verse number 9. Salvation, and that's Jonah's word, salvation is of the Lord. If you're lost and you're dying, you're unsaved, you don't know where you're going when you die, hey, uh, that's all right. Jonah has an answer. Salvation is of the Lord. If you're in your sin, I said earlier tonight, it's the same concept for a lost person. Only difference is a saved person is already saved. They can't really go to hell. But God can sure chasten them and bring them back to his will. If you're, if you're unsaved, you're definitely outside the will of God. You need to get it right. The only way to do that, you have to understand that you're dead in your sin. You must repent. Trust in the Lord. Because salvation is only through the Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the answer, if you're lost. So... Much like that of Jonah, Jonah said, I will, I will pay that what I have owed, that what I have, that what I have vowed. As I said, we have a reasonable service. If you're, if you're running from the Lord and you don't have it right, get it right. Ask God to forgive you. Get right with God. Don't wait till the last minute. If you know you're not in the will of God, you know you're not serving the Lord like you're supposed to, if you know your life's not right and it's in shambles and you're wondering why everything's going wrong, Give it back to God before it gets a whole lot worse. And just trust the Lord. Serve God. You'll be much happier if you just serve the Lord anyways. True statement I've ever said. You'll be much happier serving the Lord than you will doing your own thing. Don't go down like Jonah. Rise up and serve the Lord.